Good evening, everyone. Just like to welcome you to the uh, uh, Pallium Lecture. I want to first start off by thanking Ellen Bartelt, President of Divine Savior Holy Angels, which is celebrating their 125th anniversary of developing ex exceptionally great young women of faith, heart, and intellect, and for hosting us uh, once again this year. Thank you, Ellen, so much. Uh, Ably assisted by a campus minister, and I think many of you were probably greeted by her, Kathleen, Cull uh, Kathleen Cullen, uh, and the assistant to the president, Stephanie uh, Chosnick, and Norma Herbers, a um, good friend of mine who's a community relations officer. Um, uh, they were all part of welcoming us uh, to this pallium lecture. Uh, we have a, f a few people we'd like to single out um, here. Um, uh, we're very happy to have with us um, uh, Bishop Emerit uh, Emeritus Auxiliary, uh, Richard Skilba. No, Father Skilba, where, Bishop Skilba, where are you? Where, thank you. Then my, my vicar for urban, uh, urban ministry is uh, uh, Father uh, uh, Tim Kitsky. Um, uh, he's a very shy, quiet, and reserved individual. Um, but he will autograph Milwaukee Magazine with, since he was the cover, a story of it for anybody who would like. But Tim has done a wonderful job being the face of uh, urban affairs for us here and helping us to focus our attention on uh, the needs of, uh, of the city. So thank you very much, Tim, for being here. Another Vicar General, thank you. Another Vicar General, uh, Father David Reith, who is uh, Vicar for Catholic Charities, uh, is here present. Catholic Charities uh, reaches out and um, assists so many in need across our 10 counties, and Dave has taken that upon himself to be uh, the director and help focus our resources on especially the, the needy. Um, I'd, I'd like Rick Graber to stand. Rick, please stand. Rick is uh, president of the uh, Bradley Foundation. We have had a relationship. Please, Rick, stand. We have had a relationship with the uh, Bradley Foundation that goes back to my predecessor, uh, that uh, kind of fairly tall, overweight fella that went to New York. Uh, uh, who's now Cardinal Dolan, um, and t Tim wanted to do something to um, uh, pick up the um, intellectual interest in the problems that faced us as a city and our ability to address uh, those things through um, um, our reason, our thought, um, and basically our programs. And uh, the, the Bradley Foundation has been right with us right from the very start uh, on helping to do that and helping to refashion and reform um, our city along the lines of thoughtful assessment. So I thank Rick very much. Uh, Dr. Christine Farr is here. Uh, Christine, if you'd stand up so that people, she is the new president of Mount Mary University. And Kathleen, Kathleen Reinhardt, I know you're here, I saw you. Kathleen, if you'd stand, she's in the back there. She's the interim, interim president of Cardinal Stritch University and a, a former presenter of, uh, of the Pallium Lecture. Uh, Dean Kearney is here, who is the dean of the Marquette Law School. And I know Joe is here. Joe, if you'd stand up, thank you so much. Thanks, there it is. Now, one of the questions that everybody asks is, uh, what is a pallium, and why is it a pallium lecture? Uh, w well, uh, this is the pallium. And the pallium is an overlay that's placed over the vestments. So when you, you see a archbishop in a ceremony, you will see that this literally is is over the vestment, whether it's green or white or red, this is placed over the top of the vestment, and, and it is a sign of uh, fullness of Episcopal authority in the region. Um, and so I, um, I am the Archbishop of Milwaukee, and um, I have the, um, the province of Wisconsin. And there are four other dioceses within um, our province. And whenever I celebrate a, um, a service in any of those other dioceses as well as our own, 
I get to wear this. Uh, it's a sign of the um, uh, Episcopal authority, but it's also a sign of the union with the universal church. Um, and so when the pallium is given to you, it's, it's given to you by the Pope, and this one was um, uh, placed on, uh, over my vestment by uh, uh, former uh, Pope Benedict and um, um, in a major service uh, in Rome. Uh, the pallium um, originally was pinned to the vestment. And so if you note, one side does not have a pin, all the others, the front, the back, and the one side, and that's so that the bishop's arm could be free to do the blessings as he would, ah, here, here we go up and basically up and down the aisle. The, as the vestments got um, more particular in, in nature, there was less need to have the, the, the pins to the, to the flow of the vestment. And so the pins become ceremonial. Um, they can be very expensive. You know, because it depends upon what they're fashioned out of. Um, and so, you know, there's some pins that can be as much as fourteen and fifteen thousand dollars. Mine is nine dollars and seventy-five cents, so I just <laughs> like to let you know. So um, so they're they're actually there's they're ceremonial costume jewelry, so it's basically ceremonial and it um, uh, again is a sign. When when uh, our, then Archbishop Dolan received his pallium, again, he wanted to do something which basically highlighted his own Episcopal authority and his responsibility to the city um, and dealing with some of the issues that we all share um, uh, together and an ability to reach out for the common good. Um, and so um, he said, what, what better way to exercise his own Episcopal authority by naming basically the lecture series after basically the symbol that represents his authority. So that's what the, the, the pallium is. I, I now would um, like to call on Father Phil Bagaki. Phil is one of our wonderful uh, um, uh, young pastors, Christ the King uh, uh, Parish. Phil is also in studies for his uh, licentiate in, in canon law at Catholic University um, in Washington, and he will um, uh, lead us in, in prayers. And um, Norma Herbers and the Angel Heirs will help us also, right? Yeah. Did, did I say it right, Angel Heirs, is that it? Yeah. Yeah, it's good, yeah. And it has something to do with angels, right? Oh, yeah, okay, good. Uh, DSHA? Man, I'm making the connections for you. So, okay. So, uh, the angel ears will help us and lead us in, uh, in prayer to start us off. God bless you. Thanks for coming. Really, I, I really appreciate it. I particularly like this subject because I, I, I have been touched by so many individuals who have done creative things in the business world uh, to demonstrate their faith and put their faith into practice for um, uh, many of our um, individuals. Um, I've, I've watched and I've seen particular struggles. Uh, I've watched individuals actually put their entire fortunes on the line to protect the, the people that um, made up their business, um, uh, the businesses that they uh, were in. I, I watch courageous things. And I, I always object to the fact that businesses is termed to be self-interest and, and all, oftentimes seen in the, the, the lens of greed. It absolutely is not true, um, be, at least by my estimation, because I've seen so many who've done so much positive and so much good. So thank you very much for coming, and I'm going to turn it over to Father Phil. Thank you.
Let us mark ourselves with the sign of our faith. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. O God, who chose to manifest the blessed hope of your eternal kingdom, by the toil of Saints John de Brebeuf and Isaac Jogue and their companions, and by the shedding of their blood, graciously grant that through their intercession, the faith of Christians may be strengthened day by day. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Let us be seated. A reading from St. Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians. We urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, cheer the faint-hearted, support the weak, be patient with all. See that no one returns evil for evil. Rather, always seek what is good, both for each other and for all. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In all circumstances, give thanks, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophetic utterances. Test everything. Retain what is good. Refrain from every kind of evil. May the God of peace himself make you perfectly holy, and may you entirely, spirit, soul, and body, be preserved blameless for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will also accomplish it. The word of the Lord. We take a moment of silent reflection at this point in our day. As we give thanks to God, as we recall, how does your joy in the Lord permeate your daily life? And how can you make your daily work a prayer of thanksgiving to the Lord? Let us stand. Following the intercessions, please respond, Christ be our light. For all church leaders, that they may lead us into lives of holiness, we pray. Christ be our light. For all civic and business leaders, that they may let God direct their efforts, we pray. Christ be our light. For all workers, that they may practice their labors as a calling from God, we pray. Christ be our light. For all people of faith and goodwill, that they may serve the suffering and oppressed, we pray. Christ be our light. For all of us gathered here, that we may resist returning evil for evil and always seek what is good, we pray. Christ be our light. God of all nations, we offer you these prayers with humble and earnest hearts. We hallow your name and surrender to your holy will as we pray together for the coming of your kingdom. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Let us pray. Father, you consecrated the first beginnings of the faith in North America by the preaching and martyrdom of Saints John and Isaac and their companions. By the help of their prayers, may the Christian faith continue to grow throughout the world. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the, in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let us join in our closing hymn on page five.
Good evening and welcome. My name is Ellen Bartell. I'm the president of Divine Savior Holy Angels. And on behalf of our school community, I want to thank Archbishop Listecki for the honor and privilege of hosting you this evening and welcome each and every one of you to our high school. I also want to thank a number of people um, at Divine Savior Holy Angels who've made the entire evening possible and particularly the um, opening prayers that we just experienced. First, Father Philip, thank you so much for, he's somewhere, anyway, thank you, Father Philip. Um, and on behalf of Divine Savior Holy Angels, Norma Herbers, our community outreach officer here at DSHA, Stephanie Munson, Kathleen Cullen, and Catherine Lennon, all from our campus ministry team are present and or played a role in making this happen. Amanda Marsala, our amazing technical director who's back there and will shortly make sure that all of you can be heard. No pressure, Amanda. Um, Becky Wickert and the Angel Airs, who I, I get teary every time I hear the Angel Airs sing and that those girls were able to make time out of the, the very busy lives of high school students to lead us in um, prayerful song. I'm very grateful for that. And to Stephanie Chosnick, my assistant, who really has run this, you know, in concert with Connie Bach from start to finish, I want to say thank you. And I hope that you will join me in thanking them for all that. <laughs> this evening's Pallium Lecture is entitled, Beyond Career to Calling, Acting as Leaders in the Public Square Who Serve God. An, an important topic in any age, and perhaps per, it, seems in, it seems particularly apt now. This evening it will be offered in a moderated conversation format that Archbishop Listecki introduced to faithful pallium attender, attendees last year. It is his hope that this format will engage each one of us intellectually and emotionally in the topics and questions being examined. Further, it is his hope that we will generate continuing discussion about this topic in our homes, our parishes, our prayer groups, our leadership gatherings, and certainly following the conversation at the reception in the quad this evening. Participating in this vigorous and thought-provoking exchange this evening are our panel members, Dr. Michael Naughton, William Bowman, and moderator, Dr. Daniel Schulz. Michael Naughton is the director of the Center for Catholic Studies at the University of St. Thomas in Minnesota. He's a full professor and holds the Cook Chair in the Department of Catholic Studies. Bill Bowman has led companies as president or CEO for over 25 years. He's currently the dean of the Bush School of Business and Economics at the Catholic University of America. One of the goals of the Bush School is to help businesses understand how to apply the principles of Catholic social doctrine in their organizations. And this evening's moderator, Dan Scholes, is currently Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at Cardinal Stritch University. He also holds a tenured position in the Religious Studies Department at Cardinal Stritch, where he served as chair from 2006 to 2011. The panel will entertain questions following the moderated conversation. At that point, you will be asked to proceed to the aisles to ask your question in either microphone or near the stage. With that, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Ellen. Good evening, everyone. And a special welcome, of course, to our esteemed colleagues, Mike and Bill. Um, I knew we were in trouble when they came in from, the, from Washington, D.C. and from the Twin Cities, and uh, they immediately offered condolences for Aaron Rodgers to me um, and to all of the Green Bay Packer fans. So even though the Bears and the Redskins are happy about it, um, we're still suffering through it. So we're excited about tonight's conversation. Uh, tonight's, it, it, this, is, this is really an outgrowth from um, Pope Benedict XVI's 2009 encyclical, Charity in Truth. Some of you may be familiar with it. It was really a, a social encyclical uh, that focused on the problems of global development and progress toward the common good, ranging in topics from hu the hunger and environment to cultural relativism and free market economics. As with other modern papal encyclicals, charity and truth elicited reactions from various religious, political, and business leaders. One such reaction was a document produced in 2014 
from the Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace entitled Vocation of the Business Leader, a reflection. Uh, we are hopeful that you saw this as you were coming in. You, we would really encourage you to, if you haven't yet, to pick this up and read this. Um, it's what we're going to be in dialogue about this evening. And so um, really a compelling response to that encyclical. Um, it, this was really designed as a handbook and a guide uh, for, for businessmen and women in the profession as well as for um, deans of colleges of business um, who in universities and colleges who are charged with educating and forming future business leaders. So we really decided on this months ago and had been sort of talking email wise and one of the things that really caught our attention immediately about this document was an assertion made fairly early on, and if you're familiar with the document, you may, you may be familiar with this quote. The obstacle of a divided life is one of the more serious errors of our age. Given the plethora of serious errors in our age and today, we were really struck by the idea of a divided life. Because in many ways, this isn't just about the world of business, this is for all of us. You know, who, who in this auditorium doesn't struggle with trying to integrate your personal faith life and your communal faith life with your day-to-day -day work? So we really wanted that to be sort of the launching uh, discussion point about how, how do we overcome this divided life? How do we, as believers in Christ, overcome the split that often occurs between our faith and our daily practices at work. So with that as the context, we wanted to begin with a question posed to both Mike and to Bill. And so we have an opening question. And this is, this is in reaction to the quote, the obstacle of a divided life is one of the major, more serious errors of our age. So I'm gonna ask Mike to respond first to the question, and it's really twofold. How do you see this manifested today? And how would you recommend overcome this divided life? Mm. You know, it's interesting, the, um, that phrase that you've been using, the more serious errors of our age, uh, that comes out of a Vatican II document called Gaudi et Spes. Mm. And it's interesting, if you do a word search in that document, that phrase, the more serious errors of our age, only comes up twice in the document. Mm. One referring to this question of the divided life, and the other one referring to the question of atheism, right? Which is an interesting thing. So the question is, how do we see it? And, and I would argue that it's far more subtle than most of us think. Because one of the things we have to recognize that we're all divided. It's part of the human condition. And that subtlety can sometimes escape us. So let me give you a story. Uh, it's a story I'm fond of telling. Um, but I grew up on the south side of Chicago Bishop Listucky and I are having a bit debate over who should be, whether a Sox fan or a Cubs fan. He thinks I've kind of, I've, I've done some really serious sin by being a Cubs fan, but we'll, we'll work on that a little bit later. But I was about 16 and I was walking out the door and my father, both of my parents are from Ireland, and my father was somewhat tired of the shenanigans that I was participating in. And he looked at me and he said, Michael, Michael, you'd be a good boy, Michael. I said, sure, Dad, whatever, All right? And before I could take another step, my dad looked at me and says, Michael, now Michael, if you can't be good, you be careful. <laughs> sure. Well, an unfortunate event happened to me that night, and my father had to pick me up from a Chicago police station. Uh, by the way, Archbishop, it was the one on the 111th Street. I don't know if you remember that one. You may know about that one too, I guess. Um, and so he walks into the police station, he looks at me and he says, Michael, Michael, I think you better just be good. <laughs> now, I, I tell that story because we, we live in a culture that tends to get fixated on being careful. So we have designated drivers, right? Safe and careful drivers who take home drunk and stupid friends. We have this thing called safe sex, somehow thinking if we have disease-free, non-productive sex, it will make up for its procreative and unitive meeting. We have an educational system that constantly is driving into test scores and to grades to get to the next step, to get to the next level. And what have we done for children? We've driven the love of learning out of them. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, we have career strategies where we want to go from here to there to get to the next step. 
but we've lost sight of what does it mean to have good work. So I raise this problem that sometimes we live in a culture that is so fixated on the careful, we've lost sight of the good. And if you want to get a great sense of this in a modern way, David Brooks, as many of you probably know, he's a commentator on public radio and, and public television, has written a very interesting book called The Road to Character. And in the prologue of that book, he actually draws upon a very interesting and very, very insightful Jewish rabbi, an Orthodox Jewish rabbi by the name of Joseph Soloveitchik. And he wrote a very interesting book called The Lonely Man of Faith. And in that book, he says, as we should all know, and being a biblical scholar here, that when you go to the book of Genesis, there's not one creation story, there's two. And what he says is that these are not, the authors didn't just slap this together because they didn't know what to do with it. He says, in those two creation stories, the reason why there's two is that those things are representing a power that's in us. And so in the first one, he calls Adam one, the first creation story. And that is, if you remember the story, God, we are made in the image of God to do what? To subdue and have dominion of the earth. It is Adam the, Adam the maker, homo faber, man the maker. This is the entrepreneur, the one who goes in and creates things and does things, the deep sense of being an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. right? But then you go to the second creation story. And what happens here? Man is taken out of dust. God blows into his nostrils. He's placed in the garden to what? Not to have dominion, but to till and preserve it. Right? This is kind of the environmentalist in many respects. But it's also not man the creator, but it's man the receiver. And what Soloveitchik points out is that we have these two capacities in us. This great capacity to do things, to work, but we also have this great capacity to receive things. Mm -hmm. And the Catholic tradition we talk about is the active and contemplative life. Yep. And here's the insight of both Soloveitchik and David Brooks. What he points out is that we're increasingly living in a culture that elevates Adam 1 and discounts Adam 2, right? Yeah. Adam 1 is often elevated and rewarded in massive ways and is put together on a pedestal, whereas Adam 2 tends to get suppressed. It's a kind of waste of time and things of that sort. And I say, I would think that gets at the deep sense of, the, of what we might call the divided life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I have a follow-up to that right away before, before, Bill, you respond to that? Because now you've provoked me talking about uh, Genesis and the two Adams. And I really like that insight about, you know, Adam the, the maker and Adam, Adam the receiver. Something about Adam the receiver and that Adam and Eve that till the soil and take care of the garden. You know, one of the, as that story unfolds, and I know many of you are familiar with it, one of the, one of the challenges that they have is resting well after tilling the soil. And, you know, finding a divided life, finding an integrated life by resting. And yet, it's in the rest where the sin occurs, where the where the, the original sin, if you will, the sin of disobedience. Do you have, a, do you have a, a sense of how to avoid the sin of disobedience in resting well? Mm. I think there's a lot of different ways of getting at that. But here's the simple one. Mm -hmm. Keep holy Sabbath. <laughs> you know, we, it's, a, it's a commandment we tend sometimes not always to take seriously. I often say to people, what if I reacted to uh, adultery, like I do the Sabbath. Honey, I tried it this week, didn't quite work, but I'll try it next week. <laughs> yes. I won't have a marriage for very long. No. But keep holy Sabbath is one of the big ten. And here's what I would even go a little farther. If we don't get rest right, we'll never get work right. If we don't get Sunday right, we'll never get Monday right. And I think that's a critical kind of way of thinking about it. And I think the question of the Sabbath and the Lord's Day is of critical importance, particularly in our culture. And I think often sometimes what's behind many of the problems that we have is that we have failed in the question of rest. Now, this is not an easy issue because some people, of course, and by the way, there is a lot of stuff going on here. There's a lot of people who talk about the importance of rest, and, the, and but it tends to be actually almost therapeutic. And it often gets disconnected from a deep sense of what we might call worship. 
And so I would say there are two elements of this, of this question of, of right rest. One is, 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 is a deep sense of rest that we might be understood, particularly in terms of silence. People like Romana Guardini and P Joseph Pieper and, and Benedict XVI, if you read their writings, they talk about the radical importance of silence in our lives. And so part of Sunday should have this deep sense of rest of silence. And that's kind of one, one area. The second area is this deep sense of worship. And so I would say one thing, when one, if one was to get practical here, what does Sunday look like for us? So watching the Packers lose to the Vikings, I guess, is probably one way of looking at it, right? Sorry. That did not bring much rest. That didn't bring much Wisconsin. rest, right? But we have to be careful because one of the challenges that we have, and we, and we, have, to, we have to negotiate this one, it's not an easy one, is that we tend to reduce rest to amusement. It's yeah. very interesting. The word amusement, which is often sometimes what takes up most of our Sundays, doesn't produce rest. Matter of fact, there's a, there's a, there's a uh, Hungarian psychologist by the name of Sandor Ferenczi who coined the term Sunday neurotic. Why is it that often on Sundays people get this low grade sense of depression, boredom, unease? Because they've tried to rest and they failed to rest and they ended up in, the, in that particular area. So we got to learn how to rest well. And I think that's where some real creative, practical things can be done about how do you structure your Sunday that both allows for that silence and allows for that worship, that both provides the combination for deep rest that then helps us understand what our work should be for. Wow. And that's, the, that's a pathway to an integrated life. I think absolutely. Yeah. And it's simple. Mm -hmm. it, this, is, this is not rocket science. But sometimes our culture has kind of disordered things. And again, going back to Brooks, he says, we've discounted Adam II. We've, 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 we've undersold Adam II. Yeah. And what needs to be, and, and, and what's interesting about the book is he points out, how do you begin to do that? How do you bring that back up yeah. in such a way that it doesn't mean, you don't want to, it's precisely what Archbishop Listecki said, you don't want to denigrate Adam I. The absolute accomplishments that have occurred in business and politics, technology, is absolutely amazing. But it will not lead to the salvation of our souls. Yeah. It's that rest question that needs to find itself to be elevated and connected in that kind of profound way. What makes that second story so profound and so applicable to America, that that was, scholars think that, that, that the story of Adam and Eve probably emerged during the Israel's monarchy period, hmm. a time when they when they had unprecedented wealth and success and needed to hear that message of how do you rest? That's great. Yeah. 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 Do you think Brooks would be okay if we still did laundry on Sunday? Because that's a big, big part of our Sundays that our house is doing laundry. Well, you know what the Jews would do is that they would say, you should probably do it on Saturday. <laughs> or they would just say do it on Friday, of course. But uh, that is, I think sometimes yeah. Saturday often goofs us up. Yeah. Because there are certain things we should, that we're doing on Sunday we should do on Saturday. Yeah. And so it's trying to get at that order. Yeah. And by the way, one last point. If you really want to protect the Sabbath, one of the things you have to do is prepare for it. And I don't mean big preparation. My wife, my wife and I made a commitment in 1999. And there's, there's a long story, which I won't go into, about why we made it to, in a sense, reclaim the Sabbath in our household. Hmm. And there were strains in the marriage. There were strains with the kids. There were kind of issues I was dealing with work. And it was a beautiful thing. And, and I would say my wife has become the champion of it. But she does, she puts in her calendar every Wednesday, think about Sabbath. And for those 10 minutes, she just gets a few things and she goes, okay, we gotta do this, this, and this, and that, done. Just take 10 minutes. I, here, here's what I would say. Uh, and I, I hope I'm not, I don't think I'm overemphasizing it. Sabbath saved my marriage. Hmm because work was dominating my life. And it helped, it gave us the space and time to deal with things that the rest of the week we were just simply smoothing right over, just yeah. skimming right yeah. over. And that's the other problem. We just skim right over, because we're so darn busy. Yeah. We don't have time to deal with these things. So we just skim right over. Yeah. And after a while, all that builds up, builds up resentment, unless you don't provide the time and space in which to deal yeah. with it. And creates the divided life. And creates the divided no. life.
Thank you. Uh, uh, Bill, I'm going to repeat the question just for the audience's sake and for maybe for your sake to, to refocus on the original question. Um, the idea of the divided life, the obstacle of the divided life being one of the more serious errors of our age, and the twofold question of how do you see this manifested today, and how would you recommend overcoming this divided life? Great. Well, I think that there are three kind of common buckets for all of us who work. We've compartmentalized our lives into a work life, into a family life, into a spiritual life, and maybe there's some other ones. But we tend to think of them separately. And it's not uncommon for us to have one set of rules and objectives for one of those buckets, one of those lives, and yet have another set of rules for something else. For instance, we might find ourselves focused on maximizing the financial future of our companies, but those tactics that we use in business, we'd never consider bringing into our home. Or, or we may see properly honoring God on the Sabbath, but then just going right out and leaving parts of the Ten Commandments behind as we go to work the next Monday. Well, this is a definition of a divided life. We check various principles at the door when we enter our office, our home, or our church, and emphasize others. St. Jose Maria, the founder of Opus Dei, talks about this. He says, there is no clash, no opposition between serving God and serving men, between the exercise of our civic rights and duties and our religious ones, between the commitment to build up and improve the earthly city and the conviction that we, we are passing through this world on our way to our heavenly homeland. He continues, here too, as I never tire of repeating, we can see that unity of life, which is, essential, which is an essential condition for those who are trying to sanctify themselves in the midst of the ordinary situations of their work, of their family, and of social relationships. Jesus did not, does not allow any division here, he says. No one can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love the other, or if he subjects himself to the first, he will despise the other. The exclusive choice of God that a Christian makes when he responds fully to his call impels him to refer everything to our Lord and at the same time to give his neighbor everything that justice requires. So here we have the opposite of a divided life, which is really called unity of life, where everything is offered to God, our work, our family situations, our spiritual life, of course, our friendships with people outside our family, and so forth. So how do we get there? How do we go about practically trying to live a unity of life if, in fact, we find ourselves compartmentalized into these other buckets? Well, if we think of our work environment, we might try, before we go into a meeting, to actually offer the, the work product of that meeting to God before we even begin. And we might, in fact, greet the guardian angels of the other people who are coming into that meeting as a way of really bringing our Lord and centering that, that work that we're doing on the important person in the room, which is Jesus Christ. You might be asking yourself, well, what does the will of God have to do with our decision to roll out a particular product, if that be the purpose of the meeting? But God is very interested in our rollout plans for that product. He's interested in everything we do. He's more interested in it than we are. And so kind of focusing on him and thinking about him as we embark on work is one way that we can give him glory. Just offering an hour of work to God is another way of doing this. It's not that we're going to spend that hour, you know, thinking about God and praying. Nothing wrong with that, but we've got work to do, right? But just beginning that work with a, a short prayer and then getting into it and then doing it as well as we can, because if we're offering it to God, we can't offer him something junky. It's got to be something good. So we'll work better. We'll become better professionals. The work that we do will help more people. Just that simple act of saying, Our Lord, this is for you. Let me give you this hour of work and I will uh, do it as well as I can for you. What about family life? Here again, everything that we do with and for our family should be centered on God. He's the most important person in our family, and we can invite him to be present at our family meals, of course. 
by saying the blessing before and after dinner. Concentrate on that after dinner one, which is what we certainly skipped a lot. But that's a wonderful way to kind of wrap up, wrap up that supper and, and just to say, well, thank you. We had a great conversation. Love the meal. It was wonderful. And we understand that, that this is from you. This is one of your blessings. When we're on the sidelines of a soccer game, instead of yelling and screaming at the opposing coach, probably well deserved, we might encourage the members of our team and even the opposing team to play fair and to play hard. And maybe we just deliberately forget the score of the game if we've lost and uh, still go ahead and, and reward the kids by taking a trip to Dunkin' Donuts. But again, just maybe before they go out on that field, just saying, you know, Let's just say a little prayer that you play hard, you play fair, and that, you know, if it be God's will that you win. And if it's not, it's not your fault, really. It's just that God figured out that your soul would be better served by a loss today. <laughs> well, in family life, we should make sure that our spouse knows that he or she comes first, before the children, before our friends. We should ask ourselves whether we're working to mirror the Holy Family, who set a marvelous example for us in Nazareth. There, of course, God was the center of family life, just as he should be in our homes. Finally, our spiritual life. Maybe it's a little bit easier to see how, obviously, honoring God fits into our, our unity of life centered on him. But that focus shouldn't be just for Sundays, just for the Sabbath. It should be part of our life every day. So we need a daily plan. We need a, a plan of life which might consist of Holy Mass, frequent confession, daily prayer, the rosary, some spiritual reading, and very importantly, at the end of the day, an examination of conscience. Just a short trip through our day. Where did I do things well? Where, did, you know, where can I improve? Maybe capped off with a quick resolution of something that I'll try to get done the next day. So the antidote to living a divided life is in fact seeking a unity of life that's centered on God. It means that we work to offer everything that we do at work to him, everything we do in our family and everything we do in our spiritual life, knowing that he has a plan for us and that if we embrace that plan and live our lives for him and not for ourselves, we will attain our purpose in life, which is to get to heaven and to bring as many others there as well as we can. Thank you. That I actually try to do that. I, I try to think about integrating those different parts of my life and having God at the center. I, for me, it's an issue of sustainability. How do you, like, I can come in and out of awareness of those different spheres and trying to, trying to overcome the divided life by a unity of life. Do you, do you have any tips on sustainability? How do, you, how do you do that on a daily basis? Well, you know, we'll all fail, of course, and I love the gospel stories because they're just stories of the failure of the apostles. You know, they'll live something really, really well, and then they'll be talking about who's the greatest among them. <laughs> or they'll be doing, you know, they'll be praying well, and then all of a sudden they're off thinking about something else. And in a sense, failure is part of life. We have to love it, we have to embrace it, and we have to understand that God doesn't really care as long as we have an attitude of beginning again so that if we've done something wrong or we just haven't done things as well as we, we could particularly, that we just say, oh gosh, I'm really sorry. You know, but let me offer that failure to you and would you please turn it around tomorrow so that I can succeed at that. And then we begin again. We do our best the next day. It takes all the guilt away, takes all the pressure away. It's really acting with ourselves as God is acting, which is you know, with great mercy. So we should have mercy on ourselves and not be so caught up in you know, doing things perfectly because we can't. And if we're tempted to do things perfectly, well, that's really taking us away from God because only he is perfection. And so we should do things as well as we can, obviously, but really with him in mind, not just simply because we want to attain 100 on the test, if you will. Yeah, yeah, that is so, being merciful to ourselves, so critical. How to do. Yeah. Right. Resting well you know, bringing unity in these spheres, good responses. Any, anything else you want to say about that? Because I've got a ton of other questions. Any other follow-up? You know, it's interesting. Bill mentioned uh, Jose Maria Scarvan, who is the founder of Opus Dei. Uh, another, and of course, he was talking about many of these things years before Vatican II came about. 
The other person who was talking years about this before that was also Dorothy Day. Mm -hmm. What's interesting, we sometimes put them on the ideological you know, spectrum of you know, left and right and things of that sort, which is an interesting. But they actually thought about these things in very similar ways. Dorothy Day used to always complain that moral theologians at the time uh, would uh, respond to lay people as though they would get to heaven with scorched behinds. <laughs> You know, it was just kind of, it was kind of like just, it was a minimalism of trying to get in. And both of them had this deep sense of the vocation of the laity, even though often the language wasn't often used. And Dorothy Day had that deep sense. And, and I just find it interesting in our tradition. We sometimes, all, like all tradition, we lose certain things along the way. Mm -hmm. and, and there was a time that we kind of lost the importance about the lay life, particularly within business or within medicine or whatever it might be. But when you go back and look at the voices, it's really interesting who is saying it. And I just want to highlight, particularly Dorothy Day, I, I actually, um, my one claim, I have two claims to fame in life, and it's been all downhill <laughs> since then. My big claim to fame was I played on the Prairie Home Companion back in 1979. Mm -hmm. and, my, and my other big claim in life was I started the court canonization process of Dorothy Day here at Marquette University, wow. where I started collecting all the papers and all her journals and all her diaries. And she was extraordinary in this type of sense. Even though she was kind of a radical, you know, particularly in terms of her pacifism, things of that sort, if you go back, particularly in the 30s, she talked about a theology of work. Yep. And she was drawing upon the French, French personalist and the English distributist, you know. And so, again, these things are deep within our tradition. And there's some beautiful people out there who, who take care of that. Yeah. So. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I want to shift gears a little bit um, because so far we've been talking about how to, how to overcome sort of the challenges of the divided life and you, you both offer really wonderful uh, and really kind of different models on how to do that. Um, but this document also talks about Catholic social teachings like human dignity and the importance of the common good practice of subsidiarity and decision making as integral to good and faithful business practice as well as practices in all of our careers. A, a nagging problem that I think many of us have that we see on the horizon is the issue of the next generation coming up, uh, of the Gen Xers and the millennials of who are not necessarily churched, who are not necessarily even aware of these certain principles. Um, do you have any suggestions on how to get, how to, how to bring the next generations along to embrace these principles and, and even to adhere to them? Well, I think the, these four principles of Catholic social doctrine, the dignity of the human person, subsidiarity, solidarity, and the common good are really aspirational. They come out of the natural law so they pertain, everyone should understand them and believe in them. Who could disagree with some of these ideas? And I think that the younger people, I, the ones I see on our campus at Catholic University, they're inspired by these ideas, particularly by the dignity of the human person. That's so rich, that's so important. It affects everything that we do, that we look at each person as a child of God who's worth all of the blood of Jesus Christ. And you say, wow, if that person's worth all the blood of Jesus Christ, I've got to love them like Christ loves them. So suddenly, my whole attitude about a person changes dramatically. Now I'm really loving them because they're worth all the blood of Christ and because that person is a child of God. And that's something I think that young people can really look at and say, okay, that's really great. If we had a society that was built on that, what would that look like? How wonderful would that be? And I think that we're finding on our campus, these kids who come in as undergraduates, they don't have any clue what Catholic social doctrine is, but we begin to take them through it their freshman year, their sophomore year, and by their senior year, I think they have a pretty good idea of what this is, and they love it. They, they really see the aspirational goals of the social doctrine of our church. You know what, we see the same thing at, at Cardinal Church University here with these undergrads, that you know our, our demographics have shifted over the decades. We've been around for almost 80 years, and um, you know, today we get a lot of the undergrads who, who don't necessarily come from Catholic traditions, and yet they embrace what we call our Franciscan values. And, you know, of making peace, of reverencing creation, of creating a community, issues like that, that 
it is true they embrace those and and over the years we we try to slowly get them to understand that you know these these are human values as well as catholic values but we sort of initially present them as franciscan values as part of the charisms of what we are and that that does seem to be a way mm -hmm. to sort of get them to to, sure. to think about them as aspirational mm -hmm. yeah. how about your campus well, um, one of the challenges, and it's always been a challenge, of the Catholic social tradition is that we tend to abstract it. And so even the principles you just listed off, the danger of them is that they just kind of lay up there in this kind of high spectrum. And people are saying, I don't quite know what to do with that. I once was giving a talk to uh, some healthcare executives, and one of them said to me, he says, so how would I know if the common good bit me? <laughs> you know, I mean, what does the common good mean? Matter of fact, that's our slogan at the, our university, all for the common good. And I, I, I won't get into my critical aspect of sometimes. <laughs> no. We've actually put, after the end of it, we put TM, we trademarked it. <laughs> it's a bad thing to trademark, but anyway, <laughs> right? I mean, you can't trademark the common good, but that's another issue, right? But, but the question is, how do, they, how do they come alive? How do I see it in flesh? And this is where I think, um, and I think Bill would certainly probably do it, you got to show it in real live people. This is why in business they talk a lot about case studies. And so what does it start to look like? So if I want to pay a just wage, what does that begin to look like? And you have to get, particularly give people examples. So I, I think that type of aspect of it, you, and, and this is where education can be a great place. Show me. Show me what it looks like. And don't just show me in terms of, you know, its successes. Show me in terms of also the struggles and the tensions and even sometimes the failures of it. Yeah. And when people see that, it comes alive. So that's kind of one area. But let me highlight one other problem I think we're dealing with millennials. And uh, someone like Christian Smith from Notre Dame has highlighted this quite a bit, as well as a guy named Hugh Hecklow. And that is one of the da dangers that we're seeing is that a lot of our kids are become anti-institutional. That yeah. they see fulfillment not through institutions but outside of institutions. And much of it has to do with sometimes the, the failures of our institutions. The failures of our churches, the failures of our families, the failure of business, the failure of politics. And there's a certain kind of, that people just get tired of it and they often then look at institutions kind of of a distance, and thus they kind of use them. And they don't want to get too close to them. And so I think one of the, one of the things that what the Catholic tradition, the Catholic tradition loves institutions. <laughs> we are the best at institutions. I mean, that's a little bit of maybe of a bit of a triumphalistic thing, but who built more institutions? I mean, we were talking about this at dinner. I mean, there are over, 235 Catholic universities in this country, more than any other religious organization. Close to 50,000 schools, 25,000 uh, high schools, and all these Catholic, I mean, the Catholic healthcare market right now is about 15 to 20% of the healthcare market. And then, of course, all the social services. We love institutions, that's what we do. We build institutions, because that's how you sustain the good. And so if they're interested in the good, and here's the key, what is the good that the institution does? And what you got to try to help with young people is to help them understand you are moving, your leadership is moving into an institution and you have to have a clear understanding about what is the goods that you are to, in a sense, build up in this institution. And there you got to find ways in which to speak about it. So for example, business in the document and the document that we were dealing with. We tried to some, what are the, we, what are the goods of business? And, we, and, it's very, and it's very pithy. Good goods, good work, good wealth. But Bill said you gotta make good things. That's good goods. And by the way, that's how we get access to all the things that we often have is through business, mm -hmm. right? Business is not a bad thing. It creates the goods in which we have access. Also find good work is the work designed within that business helps people to develop. And lastly, good wealth. If you don't make a profit, you die. But profit is a, is a, is a great servant, but it's a lousy master. It's an essential means, but not a good end. And so when you can kind of help them understand what is the good of the institution, 
I think a certain nobility starts to take up for him. And I think that's going to be one of the key things, particularly for a younger generation. Mm -hmm. Did you want to respond to that, Bill? Well, I think just in the, in the, right in the same line, when people ask about our mission of the Bush School at Catholic University, it's, it's very simple. We really want all CEOs and our students to understand that the person is the purpose of the business and not the dollar. And I think if you read the Holy Father's writings, he can seem very critical about business, and he is, and I think rightly so in many respects. But I think when you read it carefully, when we're talking about the person as being helped by the business, through entrepreneurship, through new jobs, through better work, he's very positive and laudatory. When you talk about just money, that your whole goal is to make money, well, I think he properly says, well, that's really contrary to, to what the church wants you to do. And so keeping that focus on the person, again, this is what appeals to a lot of young people because they can see that, they get excited by that, and then trying to interpret these, these principles in a way that's very concrete so that they can understand, okay, if I start a business, how do I live subsidiarity? How do I live the common good? And it, it's all rooted in how do I really expand the dignity of the people that I'm in touch with. By the way, real quickly, you were mentioning Francis. A lot of people often think Francis is anti-business. And there is, there are some things that he says that are pretty edgy and, and, and things of that sort. But he often, one time, I remember in a talk that he gave, he said he got a little defensive. And he said, you know, people think I'm, I'm anti-business. He says, I'm the one who actually promoted the case of the business person, his name is Ernesto Shaw, he's an Argentinian, to, in a sense, become a saint. He says, I think people can be holy in this. But as Bill said, he says, I'm also seeing some real other problems. And he, and he, and his, and his language, and, well, I don't know if you want to get into the question, but he has a kind of prophetic, critical language that sometimes can, sometimes overcome maybe some of the deeper insights that he might have, so. Yeah. yeah. I was thinking in both of your responses, I'm sure this is true at St. Thomas and Catholic U, one of the ways that that higher ed, I think, has done well with the millennials and the Gen Xers is what we call experiential learning. Mm -hmm. That we're getting them out into these institutions early and, and showing them common good, showing them how do you, many college campuses, I'm sure yours does, are do we, we have startup businesses on the campus and we talk about how do you work those principles of subsidiarity, they, they eat that up. Yeah. 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 Well, if we could, uh, two things on that. Um, one is the danger, of course, is that we sometimes get them out there, but we don't help them reflect enough about what they're actually doing. So sometimes it's almost the flip side of it. Yeah. And so we need to not only get them out there, which I think you're right, uh, because that type of experiential learning helps it, but you just have to make sure there's enough time and space for that to have a reflection that they understand what they're actually acting upon. Well, and, and that's where you need the faculty. Right. You gotta have the faculty to buy into it and right. have the skill set to come back and process all right. of that. that. That takes a lot of professional development, and I'm right. preaching to the choirs here. Now, how do you get the faculty to own that? Right, and if I also, one more thing about the, our own self-criticism of, of, of higher education, is that sometimes we have been the culprits of the divide life. Because what we do is we drill these students into going into finance, into right. philosophy, into literature, into biology, and we help them understand all these discrete forms of knowledge. But we don't do anything to help them to understand how the knowledge is related to each other. Yeah. I mean, John Henry Newman's kind of fundamental principle was the idea of a unity of knowledge. Because what Newman was very clear that we need to read all these forms of disciplines. But we have to understand that they inform each other, they correct each other, they complement each other. Yeah. And sometimes the, the strength of the university has been specialization, but the weakness of the university is specialization. Yeah. And so we fragment the students by learning all these forms of discrete knowledges, not having a sense about how they're connected to, and we send them out into the world, and we wonder why they become so you know, particularized yeah. in what they're doing. Yeah, but you know what, and you know this well, industry, business, all, all of our industries are saying, stop doing that. To promote the liberal arts. Promote the educating the whole person. Educating and forming them. Right. Yeah. That's why I think our Catholic institutions have a real leg up. Well. We certainly at Catholic University talk to our students a lot about, when you go into a job interview, 
and they say, well, what, what do you have that this, you know, that this guy from Harvard doesn't have twice as well as you do? We say pivot that and start talking about virtue. Talk about the fact that you come from a campus where virtue is taught, where virtue is exercised, where the things like character and integrity are really important. Because those are the two words that CEOs are using more than any other word when they talk about who they want to hire. It's not the fastest guy to, who can develop an algorithm. It's a person who has character and integrity. And that's what we have with these Catholic institutions. And that's really what we should be showing the world. All these shameless plugs for our Catholic institutions. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, I have one final question before we open it up to the audience. And, and, I, and I appreciate if each of you, in your own way, might respond to this quote. It has been said that to be a Catholic in business is an advantage rather than a disadvantage. I wonder if you would agree with that or disagree with it and how you might respond to that, Bill. Well, I think if that means that being in business, understanding the principles of Catholic social doctrine that are described so beautifully in that, in that vocation of a business leader, if that's what that means, then sure. But if it's just being Catholic, I don't think much comes from that into a business. It's really the Catholic social doctrine implemented in the business that I think makes the, the company very unique. Yeah, I think that's, I think what Bill says is absolutely right. We have a long tradition. We've been at this for a long time. Um, this is a long tradition, a long series of reflections, um, which I think helps people understand the proper understanding of business. Um, so what I would say, and I, we were actually on Archbishop Listecki's radio show a little while ago. Uh, one, one wants to be careful of a statement like that, though. Because while it is true that often the moral order and the economic order will often occur, they, they'll often cohere, they'll often kind of relate to each other, they, they feed each other, they connect to each other. That's absolutely right. But sometimes they don't, <laughs> right? So uh, we have to be careful of the prosperity gospel, <laughs> thinking that somehow that if I got my faith, it's going to make everything fine. Well, a key part of our spiritual life is the cross. And sometimes we might have to sacrifice. And as I mentioned, the example of Thomas More, Thomas More became the second most powerful person in England because of his virtue and faith. St. Thomas More also got his head chopped off because of his virtue and faith. Yeah. Yes. And so these, the variables are just way too complex. So ultimately, in the end, the statement's right. Yeah. But you, got it, you want to be careful that it doesn't get disordered, that moves slowly into a kind of a prosperity gospel because yeah. actually it's a lie. And so that's, so it depends yeah. on how you, how you understand those words, I think, yeah. is one has to think about it. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. We, we would like to, to transition to open up the conversation um, to, to anyone who would like to come up. We have two microphones here. I was wondering if you could give some t advice to someone who's on the other side of bus business leadership. Um, for those of us who might work for mid to large size companies where you're lower in the hierarchy, you work for a corporation that seems to not care about the common good of their employees, where things are very transactional and bottom line oriented. <coughs> what advice do you have to give for someone like that? I've got a bunch of kids and they ask me that all the time because they work in companies like that. And um, I used to say, well, you know, just kind of work it out, try to figure it out. But life's too short. And I really am encouraging them now when they ask that question to really go somewhere else. Uh, large companies, frankly, have been trying to do these workshops based on some of these principles. And big companies just aren't interested. And even big companies run by really sincere, good Catholics are afraid to talk about their faith in context of their business. And so my focus now is on small family-owned businesses, middle-sized businesses. That's where all the growth of jobs is coming, and it's where all the innovation is coming. And I think that's the place to be. Yeah, it's, uh, everyone's situation has its own particular challenges, and one has to be mindful of it. Uh, although I'm struck, um, I was invited by, um, um, a group from Target Corporation. Target's a very large corporation in Twin Cities. Um, and uh, they, they, they had me meet at a bar, and they say, we'll, we'll give you drinks if you answer our questions. <laughs> I said, deal. Great. I'm Irish. I'm Irish, right? Well, that's it. There's an ethnic slur, guys. Um, but what struck me was, it was a bunch of Catholics 
at Target, and they meet once a month, and they come together to talk about the particular challenges they're facing at Target. And some of it was the gender ideology issue, the homosexual questions about um, some of the things they're doing. Some of it came into, uh, obviously, Target has pharmacies, so they have abort efficients and, and contraceptives, and they, and they're also some of the literature that's actually being promoted is what a lot of some people would call soft porn. And they said, we're trying to figure out how we deal with that. I was so impressed, wow. so impressed that these people at Target are coming together to think aloud about some of the problems that they're dealing with. And, um, and I guess my, you know, my, my response to them is, are they better to be at Target than not to be at Target? You know, I once had a friend of mine, uh, he's a deacon, uh, Sherman Otto, and he would come into my class, and he says, can a cop be a deacon? This is when the cops, well, obviously, obviously the police have, have really dealt with a lot of issues in terms of abuse and things of that sort. And he would often say, you know, what would happen if police departments no longer had deacons and Catholics and Christians? So I, I think Bill's right. I mean, there's certain times where you might have to say to yourself, I don't think this is a good place for me anymore because it's getting so thick, it's getting so, I mean, um, you're, you're seeing this in a lot of institutions these days, and can you really operate within it? But I also think sometimes you might want to say, if you can come together with a group of people, and if we can kind of share things together and think through things, maybe there's ways in which we can negotiate and deal and make this place a better place than if we weren't there at all. Uh, and by the way, the great thing about these corporations is they all have interest groups. You know, you have gay groups there, you got women groups, you got Muslims groups. You, well, why don't you have a group of Catholics? That's not a bad thing. You got, you got the evangelicals having their Bible studies. So it's actually, in one sense, because of all the things that's going on, sometimes these larger corporations are opening up a, an opportunity that actually no one ever took before. And it'd be interesting to see if you got a group of people in your organization who's experienced the same thing. Can we do something better than what we're doing right now? If that makes sense. Thank you. Great question. Yeah, thank you. As the, as the next speaker, as the next question comes up, the, the, what's the demographics of those target employees? Were they, were they younger employees? Oh, or were yeah. They, they, they were younger. Oh, yeah. They were yeah. all young. They were all young. I mean, uh, they were... Uh, uh, just out of school, uh, probably th from there to, I think the oldest may have been about 35. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Asking important questions. Oh, they were, they were, they were awesome. They were awesome. Hmm. Great, uh, great talk. Um, I have a question about Divide Life and, and as a recovering investment banker. And, um, <laughs> you know, The Road to Character was actually a book that kind of helped me think differently. And, but, uh, you know, we talked about uh, not, you know, thinking of the unity of life, but as business leaders, uh, how do we think about social justice? I mean, we think about Adam 1 and Adam 2, and we think about Adam 2 and Dorothy Day, who really inspires me. Uh, how does you kind of push that away when you go into work, or is the inequalities that are there in front of us, and um, you can see that every day, how do you deal with that? Yeah. And how do you maybe buck the system? Yeah, it's a great question about how, how do you, I mean, social justice is a long, I mean, first of all, the, the term often gets misunderstood. Uh, the, the challenge sometimes is that a lot, of, a lot, particularly a lot of business people see social justice as a club, and they're the ones going to get clubbed. <laughs> um, and, uh, uh, and sometimes they should get clubbed because they're doing things that shouldn't do. But, you know, take the word justice. It comes from the Latin root word jus which means right. And when Aquinas speaks about justice, he talks about right relationships. And so how does one become in right relationship to others? And I do think sometimes businesses have, have become maybe even more sensitive to that question. So take, for example, the question of a wage, a right, a, a just wage. And in the Catholic tradition, the way it's understood is that there is three dimensions to a just wage. One is you need, to pe you need to pay people according to need. Because if I don't pay people according to need and they've given me their full-time work, 
I've put them in a place where it's very difficult for them to exist. That's one. This, so we call it a living wage. A second is what we might call a contributive uh, or an, an equitable wage. You pay people according to their contributions about what they have provided. And thirdly, what we might call a sustainable wage, you have to pay people in such a way that it's sustainable into the future. Because if I pay a wage that's livable and it's equitable and they go out of business, that's not a just wage, that's a stupid wage. <laughs> right? So the question is that those three are often in tension with each other. And what the business mind has to have to happen is they have to be prudent in such a way as how do I achieve all three of those at the same time? And I think often, sometimes, business people have that sense of, of a challenge. Because what's too often that happens is they often will focus on one or two, but not the third. And, and a business person who's really concerned about their employees will be concerned about their needs. And so while it'd be difficult to do that, they, at least it's a challenge that they can at least try to work on. So I think if we can just describe it right, I think sometimes business people, because business people do promote justice. And if they don't promote justice, it's, it's you know, organized robbery. That's what business is, if justice is not a part of it. Um, but sometimes we don't, justice is not, the state is not the only answer to the justice that needs to happen within the business. So Bill, I don't know. I think that if you can really practice acts of human dignity during the day, that social justice can really take on a whole different meeting, a much richer meeting. But it's that we all have to practice that. It's very hard to do, by the way. When I uh, decided that I was going to actually try to live my day at work uh, with a real focus on the dignity of the human person, the first thing that hits you is terror, because what that means is you're going to have to really worry about all the aspects of that person, not just their productivity. And as soon as you do that, you're opening yourself up to a discussion about other things going on, maybe at home or maybe in their lives, maybe someone, a friend has died or something of that sort. And that all takes time. And the one thing we don't have as business people is time. So it's really hard to do. But even if I did one or two of those a day, I went home at night thinking, boy, I really made a contribution here that I never made before. And I think if we can all practice that, just try one or two acts where we're really promoting the dignity of the people that we're dealing with, um, that some of these issues become a lot clearer. But it's rooted in that human dignity. Just one little follow-up on that is, what about institutional social justice? You know, we talked about the individual, right. thinking about the individual, but what about institutionally across? Sure, so the institutional social justice, can you just say a few more words on that? Well, what do you think of all the stuff that's going on right now in terms of, you know, Black Lives Matter or you know, stuff that is that this inequality, obviously, everywhere, uh, not, you know, maybe in different degrees, but, mm -hmm. but do you have to care about that at work or does it be part of your personal life? Well, I think going back to another phrase of St. Jose Maria that I really love is that there really is only one race and that's the race of the children of God. If you really think about that, you know, really deeply, and you, you just understand, well, my goodness, color just disappears, you know, ethnic backgrounds disappear. Every person is absolutely precious. And, you know, to the extent that we really can believe in that and live that, it changes our whole attitude. I, I, I kind of concentrate on the things that work rather than the institutional things, so I know those better. But it really, it really changes how you spend the rest of your day and what your attitude is towards people. You know, John Paul talks a lot about the question of solidarity. And, uh, and, and a lot of us who may not be part of uh, sometimes the uh, predicaments of, you know, African Americans in particular, in particular difficult areas, and, and other Native Americans, for example, uh, who have also suffered tremendously in the things that they're doing. Sometimes we, we, we can judge harshly and we can become insensitive to the plight. And one of the things we always have to be careful, what we always have to have is a deep sensitivity to the sufferings of others. Um, and so that would hopefully highlight. And it's to recognize, for example, that uh, business is not going to solve everything. 
And that's why we need the state. But the state's not going to solve everything. So when you think about institutional injustice, we need to think about it on multiple levels. So let me give you one example. The, this is what a, a man named Charles Murray who call, wrote a book, an interesting book called Coming Apart. And one of the things he points out is when you go back to the 1960s, there was great mobil mobility in the United States. We prided ourselves on being a mobile country, that, uh, that people who, who are uh, in, in lower class can move into middle class, people in middle class move into up, and we still think that's the case. The data ain't showing it. Matter of fact, Denmark's more mobile than we are when it comes to economics. The poor are stuck in the poverty, and the middle class are stuck in that area. And so Murray starts to say, well, why is that the case? And again, the reasons are complicated. But one interesting issue that sometimes a Black Lives Matter doesn't quite take seriously, I think, is family structure. Because if you look at the family structure in the 1960s, the divorce rates of those on lower, lower to middle class were about 86%. Those on a higher class were in the 90s. In the 60s and 70s, that divorce rate starts increasing for both classes. But in the 80s and 90s, it stabilizes in the upper middle class and rich, and it actually begins to go down. But for the poor, it increases dramatically. So today, 72% of all African American children are being born into one single parent households. Some of them do it with phenomenal heroic uh, virtue, but most don't. And so the family structure has been somewhat decimated, and I don't often think that we have given that question of that structure the kind of attention that it might need. It's not the only thing that needs that. We need to think about welfare, we need to think about the state, we need to think about what that has to happen. But I think that becomes another interesting structural problem. If I could just add Thank one you. other point. We, um, you know, listening to the Holy Father, our whole goal at the university is really to try to understand what he's saying. So we don't criticize him, we wrap our head around what he's talking about. And we were listening to him talk about going out to the peripheries. And so we brought our faculty together and we said, what does that mean to us here in the business school? And what it meant was, gosh, we're, you, Catholic University is right in the middle of absolute poverty, abject homelessness, drug problems, everything else. You walk, honestly, 150 feet off our campus and everything changes. And so we said, we don't have to look very far. This is a periphery. You know, these, these eight wards of the District of Columbia are our periphery. And so we said, what can we do? And we said, well, we do business stuff. So we worked, uh, contacted a professor at Harvard Business School, and we went into a partnership with them to identify 125 inner city businesses that would benefit by additional funding so that they could get bigger and hire more people and actually reduce the unemployment in Washington, D.C., and who needed help with marketing strategy. And, you know, we went through this process uh, identified 200 big companies, they nominated these smaller companies, and we now have 125 that came to our university two weeks ago uh, to kick off this process. Mm -hmm. So that's what we can do. We do business stuff. We're going to try to really address joblessness in Washington, D.C. through, a, uh, through a, a, a program of helping small businesses get bigger. Great. That's great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for one more question. As he's coming up, I one of, the, one of the things that really intrigued me about that gentleman's question about social justice, it's the, our culture today has so many sort of flashpoint words that, that that term, social justice, can either draw you in and compel you to questions or alienate you. And how you talk about it, that it's really about right relationships. Right. That, that if we can learn as a culture to just shift the focus a little bit off of these flashpoint terms, um, even Black Lives Matter, as you, as you talked about it, it, it is so much the key. Yeah. So, final question, sir. Uh, yes, my question is actually twofold. So the first part of it is, as a millennial who has been disillusioned by institutions, our political institutions, um, some of our Catholic institutions as well, how does the Catholic Church now turn around and get those millennials back into the church and kind of, I guess, stop the bleeding? And then the second part is, um, I work for a big corporation in U.S. Bank that prides itself on treating its employees and its community well, um, and that's something I really like. But how do we, 
and how does the Catholic Church sell CEOs and CFOs on Catholic ideals and running their business in a way that not only benefits the bottom line, but their customers, their employees, and their community? I just took the last part of that question. I mean, that is the purpose of our, you know, Bush School of Business is really to try to answer that problem. How do you actually change people's attitudes so that they are doing the right things in terms of hiring, in terms of really working with those five constituencies that you mentioned uh, within, within any business? And um, um, I guess the same, it's the same old principles, just going back to them. And the millennials in our school, by the time they're seniors, they know those four principles. They can talk about them, and they're going to actually take that out in, in the companies that they join and the companies that they eventually will start are going to be very different from what they would have been if, if they hadn't had the education they did have in that Catholic social doctrine. So I'm a big believer in it. I think it's a, it's a solution, and that's kind of what we're focusing on full-time at Catholic University. Yeah. Um, obviously, um, CEOs of organizations, it would often depend upon what type of openness they would have for these particular things. Uh, interesting enough, um, the majority of our Supreme Court are Catholics. The uh, uh, largest number of CEOs in this country have never been more Catholic than they are today. Um, and you pretty much go through the leadership of a lot of these places, you find out that there's a lot of Catholics in these particular areas. And if not Catholics, they're Christians. Uh, and so it does seem to me that's where it's a matter of evangelization <laughs> and have effective evangelization, uh, often the, which takes place in parishes. And so pastors themselves have to learn to find ways to effectively engage these types of groups, because often that's where the church is most alive for particular people. And uh, one can only hope that our universities uh, can find ways to uh, engage those populations in better ways. So I, I, in light of what Bill was saying, um, we, could always, we, we just have to do a lot better than what we have done in the past. Uh, but in terms of millennials, uh, I have millennial children. Um, and, and it's a constant kind of engagement. Uh, I, I do find uh, a lot of fascinating things going on in the church right now. Uh, just for example, on youth ministry, uh, the explosion of focus in SBO on college campuses has been kind of an extraordinary new event. And I know that here in your own diocese, you have your own kind of SBO focus program. Um, and, and there are some just, you know, sometimes we can, when we look at the world, we look at the church, a lot of us, particularly the older we get, we often see the kind of negativity and the declines and the numbers don't look great and things of that sort. But there's all these phenomenal seeds that are occurring, you know? Mm -hmm. um, Jason Everett, for example, in the way that he, he's en engaging younger people about sexuality and things of that sort. Bishop Barron, in terms of his word on fire and some of the things that he's doing. There's a lot of things going on in social media. Uh, what Focus and SBO are doing. They're engaging these young people, often on kind of a one-to-one -one basis. And I wonder whether that's probably going to be the key thing. It's not so much a program, although programs can help. But we're just going to have to find ways to do better jobs of dealing with folks on a one-to-one -one basis and in almost begin to invite them. Because one of the things we haven't done well as Catholics is that we haven't often done evangelization well. And Benedict, when he started this new office of new evangelization, I know there's an evangelization office here and that you've taken it very seriously. And I see a lot of dioceses doing this. And we're just going to have to do a much better job evangelizing the culture. Uh, and what's interesting, we're going to do it precisely when on our back. Our diocese is in bankruptcy. I know you guys just got out of bankruptcy. Who would ever thought of bankruptcy 20 years ago? That, our di that so many uh, dioceses have been into it. But this is the time. This is the excitement. These are kind of great new opportunities that can happen. So instead of coming in with great depression and despair, this is a great time for hope and, and, and finding those new ways to engage millennials. And by the way, here becomes the new generation. It's the I generation. There's a very interesting, if you haven't seen it, look on, on the web. Atlantic Monthly has a really interesting article on these are the kids being brought up on smartphones. Right? And the person is a psychologist from the University of or San Diego State University. And one of the things she says, the good news is, new generation, 
They're not doing drugs as much. They're not drinking as much. They're not having sex outside of marriage as much. They're also not going outside very much. They're not driving very much, right? <laughs> right? These are the kids that are staying in the home, right? That's the good news in one sense. The bad news is these kids are anxiety filled. Yeah. These kids are depressed. These kids are kind of, they don't know quite what to do because, you know, if their Snapchat doesn't get 200 likes, they, they kind of freak out on it, right? And so that becomes the kind of a new, every generation is going to present itself with new problems. And this is why the church has been around for 2,000 years. It doesn't collapse on these things. It responds to those new problems. And that's really the kind of challenge that we have in front of us. Bringing the millennials back to church, your, your question, one of the keys, I think, is comes from the Old Testament prophets. An image they often talked about was the remnant of Israel. And that maybe if you and others like you in your generation that are seeking to come back in saw yourselves as the remnant of your generation mm. who seeks to return and come and ask the questions of, our, of the churches, of the parishes, the compelling questions that the employees at Target are asking that leadership. Just be part of the solution rather than wait to hear how we're going to fix it, because we can't fix it without you. But the fact that you're here, you're, you're part of the remnant of a generation that can help restore it. So thank you. Michael, William, thank you. Thank, thank you for you. this evening. Thank you for the conversation. remarks I want to thank you that was fascinating uh, very rich many ideas many challenging thoughts much appreciated everyone every one of you is invited to our quad to meet with the speakers and representatives from the Milwaukee jobs work there are also some complimentary publications so that you can continue this deep dive um, the vocation of a business leader and a Catechism for Business, Tough Ethical Questions and Insights from Catholic Teaching. These have been made generously made available by our speakers. Also available is a bibliography of business-related titles available in the Salzman Library on the campus of St. Francis de Sales Seminary. And now I turn it over to Archbishop Listecki for the final word. Thanks again. Thank you. Special way, thanks to um, our presenters. Michael, Bill, thank you so much for taking the time. and. Um, I, I whispered to Connie Bach, I said, it's the most fascinating um, engagement, uh, the listening to your insights um, and rooting them so richly in um, basically the tradition. Um, thank you, Dan, for kind of leading uh, the, the discussion and making sure that we kind of stayed on, on time and on, mm -hmm. on point. So, it was uh, tough. Thank you so much. Um, thanks to so many of our supporters who um, offer donations to be able to make sure that this uh, presentation uh, was able to take place. Thanks once again to Ellen Bartelt and to Divine Savior Holy Angels um, uh, for basically their participation here. Uh, and uh, behind the scenes, always working, Connie Bach um, and Rich Harder, who um, uh, basically uh, designed and helped right from day one. So as this Pallium lecture will end, we'll already start to think about uh, next year, and Connie and, and Rich will be right there kind of looking at uh, who would be good presenters, who would be individuals that would be worth listening to. Um, and before I give um, a final blessing and we close with a final prayer, um, you know, Michael, when you were talking about um, uh, Dorothy Day, um, she was once introduced at a, a huge gala in, in New York, and the person got up and it was just waxing eloquent about Dorothy Day. Now, this is a lady who went to church every day, and although had a very troubled early life, and, uh, and literally, um, uh, you know, um, uh, a love-hate relationship with the church and with all institutions, uh, here is a lady who committed herself basically to the sacramental life of the church and the, and the work of the poor. Uh, well, he was waxing eloquent about Dorothy Day, and he said to everybody, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I want to introduce to you a, a truly a living saint. And of course, everybody stood up and applauded, and Dorothy Day got to the mic and she said, please, do not dismiss what I do that easily. Great line. 
That because she's a saint, nobody else is supposed to be able to do the same thing. But I would offer to you that the goal for every one of us is, is to be a saint, to integrate into our lives those things that are necessary uh, to be able to serve God here so that we might, with our lives, praise him and we might draw others closer in love to him. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The disciples asked one thing of uh, the Lord Jesus. Um, Lord, he, teach us how to pray. Um, that prayer um, that we believe when said transforms us, helps us to integrate into our lives those needs that we have in this world and those desires for well-being of others. And Jesus responded to them and said, pray in this manner, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And may Almighty God bless you all, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you. Hope to engage you in conversation. We'll talk about capitalism and socialism out in the lobby a little bit, okay? <laughs> Thank you.